Are we there? Good morning. I'm there. Good morning, church. God is good. Amen. And all the time? Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. It is a great day to be here. We got some announcements before we get started this morning. Uh, Miss Michelle is our children's ministry director, and she has some information for parents and kids. Michelle? Good morning. So our secret note for kids is going to show up on the screen again. Um, Duke the detective dog is going to be up there with a secret note for them to fill in. And then we have a stump your parents question. And this question is, when should I take the Lord's Supper? So be prepared in case any kids ask you that today. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. A couple of other quick announcements coming up today. Back, if we can remember back to the beginning of 2020, Before this whole COVID mess started, us as a church, we had transitioned to some new roles, and we had uh, been looking at appointing elders, and we had five men in our church, and we were getting ready to have a business meeting to appoint our elders and some new deacons, and COVID hit, and that meeting was canceled, and so we've gone through 2020 with five elder candidates functioning in that role, and today at four o'clock, we are going to be having that business meeting Finally, back from March, I believe it was March 15th, when we were supposed to have that business meeting. So I encourage you all to be right here in this room today at 4 p.m. for that business meeting. There's a lot. We're going to be looking at um, approving new elders and new deacons, as well as there's some other information and some great, exciting things happening that you need to be a part of and be aware of. And so we encourage everyone that's a member of South Peoria Baptist Church, or if you're becoming a member, to be here at 4 p.m. this afternoon. And we do ask, we want everybody who's able to be here, and so we ask everyone as you come in just to remember, wear your mask until you get to your seat. And once you're in your seat, you can take your mask off. Um, But we want to make sure everyone in our church body is able to participate safely in that business meeting this afternoon. Number two, I also want to talk about this coming weekend is our men's and women's event. Our Man Up Rally will be having breakfast right here in this room. We had a great turnout last month. And a really, really good breakfast. And so we're looking forward to that. At the same time, our women's ministry will be meeting up front for All Things Beautiful. And our children's ministry will be having something going on at the same time. So there's something for every member of the family this Saturday at 9 a.m. And then last but not least, John Steger Sunday School Class is starting a brand new Christmas series next Sunday about the little town of Bethlehem. And so we encourage you, if you're not involved in one of our Sunday school or Bible study programs, I encourage you, right after this service next Sunday, join John Steger and the rest of his class out in our building floor on the back side of our property and be a part of that Sunday school class. But I'm excited to be in church. I hope you're excited to be here today as we participate in the Lord's Supper. And so will you stand with us as we pray and prepare our hearts for worship today? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. You are so good. We thank you for the salvation you've given us, God. Undeserving as we are, your grace extended to us, forgiving us of our sins as you died on the cross. And God, we come together today in remembrance of that, in remembrance of looking back to the cross and the price that was paid. But as we participate in the Lord's Supper, it's a looking forward to the returning of Christ as you come as our King and our Savior. And so, Lord, we pray today as all that we do, as we open your word, speak to our hearts, and may all that we think, all that we say, and all that we do today bring our King great glory. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Please join us as we sing Jesus at your holy table. strong. 
It's a great morning today, and we're going to be in 1 Corinthians. If you have your Bibles with you or um, a tablet, iPhone, anything you got, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians this morning, chapter 11, and we're going to be starting in verse 17. Starting in verse 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have, been, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat, for when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat or drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink a judgment on themselves. That is why many of you, many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we are more discerning with regard to ourselves, we, ought, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. And finally, in verse 33, so then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, for disciplining us for giving us direction, Lord, and guidance in our lives. In a time when we need guidance and we recognize the need for a savior and the need for you so much so, Lord, thank you. And we pray, Lord, as, as COVID gets resolved and as we move forward as a, as a church and as a nation, Lord, we pray that you would help us to not lose sight of you, Lord, to not lose that feeling that we need you, Lord. Help us to always cling to you, Lord, always as our rock and our redeemer, Lord. You are Yahweh Elohim, and you are the most holy and righteous God. And we thank you, Lord, and we just pray that this morning that you would help us to praise you, Lord, accurately, to lay our preferences and Lay our lives down this morning, Lord, so that you can speak to us, humble our hearts, quiet our hearts, Lord, and speak life into us this morning. We just give you the praise, honor, and glory, Lord. Amen. i 
darkness. You would have brought us out of the shadow of death. So God, let us praise you with our lips as we sing, and with our hearts as we consider the work you've done. Grant us discerning hearts to understand what is in what's in our hearts. God, convict us of the things that we need to bring before you. And as we gather this morning, let us approach you in purity and surrender. Let us surrender to you and the work you've done. We pray these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, I'd like to take this moment, ask all the men to come forward as we prepare to pray this morning. I want to thank everyone for your prayers and for reaching out to Tani and my family this week and in the last few weeks praying for us. God is good. Our family has recovered and is exciting to be back into church with you all today. So thank you for your prayers. A couple of other prayers that uh, requests I'd like for you to hold up. Uh, Lee is in the hospital. Many of you know Lee Hendrickson and uh, with COVID pneumonia. And so keep him in prayer. Speaking with Marlene or hearing from Marlene earlier this week, uh, I believe it was yesterday. And the doctors are talking about sending him home in about four days. He's responding well to the treatment. And so continue to lift him up in prayer. One of our charter members from back in 1993, um, Sam uh, Lowell, is in the hospital with, uh, with COVID as well. And his son, Ashish, has it, and it's in their family. So keep them in your prayers as well, the Lowell family. But we're also going to take this time as we continue to pray for our nation 
continue to pray for our church and continue to pray for our families. And so, men and family, church family, will you join me in prayer this morning? Lord Jesus, I thank you as we stand here today. Men created in the image of God, women created in the image of God, created to bring you honor and glory. And God, I pray for each of these men here. God, I pray that you ignite in each of us a heart to be men of God. Not perfect, God. We are far short of what we should be. But God, more and more every day, we're becoming more and more what you have called us to be. So God, I pray in the hearts of these men as they lead their families and whatever roles that looks like, God, that that heart and that fire for the Lord ignites and their first passion is to serve you and love you with all their heart and all their soul and all their mind and that they lead their families in righteousness. God, I pray for the women in this room, God, created in your image. God, I pray that you ignite in them a heart to love the Lord with all that they are. God, I pray for our families in this church, Lord, to mirror a grace that is given to us from our Creator, for us to seek you out and serve you with all that we are. That we just sang, hallelujah, all we have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus, you are our life, God. Let that be our song and our thought every single day. And God, we come to you lifting up these prayer requests and the health needs of our church. We pray for Lee right now in the hospital room. God, that you continue to heal his body, you continue to touch his lungs and continue to bring oxygen and increase that oxygen level there. We pray for Marlene as she's at, at home, unable to be by his side. That is a fearful thing. Right now, when we have loved ones go in the hospital, they go in alone. And so, God, I pray in both those rooms, where Marlene's at and where Lee's at, God, that your spirit brings peace. We pray the same for Sam and Rahil. As Sam's in the hospital, God, we pray for, for healing, and as Rahil's at home, God, for comfort. God, we pray for our nation right now, still split, still divided. God, the only thing that unites us, the only thing that brings peace, the only thing that breaks down dividing walls is Jesus through the power of the gospel and what he accomplished on the cross. So God, we pray for our nation to repent and turn to the Lord, for us to call in the name of the Lord, for us to turn away from the sin that we've embraced as a nation and repent. God, we pray for you to redeem us and to bring peace and unity back to America. God, we pray for our church. Continue to build us up in your word. Continue to build us up in our homes. God, may South Peoria be a shining light of the hope of the gospel in the city of Peoria and the state of Arizona and in this nation. And may we lead out as the men and women of God called to obedience according to your word. In your great and powerful name we pray this morning. Amen. You may be seated. All right, we got her on. Thank you. All right, it is good to be here and worship today. Uh, we have a few fewer people here this weekend after Thanksgiving than we normally do uh, than the last couple of weeks, but we're praying that COVID is on the way out, despite the numbers, you know, and what we're hearing and things. And so, uh, it is really good to be here today to celebrate the Lord's Supper today and share in the Lord's Supper today. I appreciated Mark reading for us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 a few moments ago. And uh, it's often read in times like this. And so talking about the Lord's Supper service, I've got great memories of the Lord's Supper service. And you know that churches all over the world celebrate the Lord's Supper service. There are all kinds of churches in our world from the really fantastic uh, crystal kind of cathedrals and with the stained glass windows and marble down to churches that meet under a mango tree someplace and or along the Amazon River. They're just all kinds of churches. And regardless of their name or their denomination, churches celebrate the Lord's Supper. 
And uh, we may not have the same doctrine when it comes to baptism with some of them or some of the other doctrines, but churches celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's very special. We call it communion. Some churches call it the Eucharist. Some churches call it breaking bread together. In fact, I think there are only two groups of people that don't celebrate the Lord's Supper and, and uh, Salvation Army is one of those, and uh, the Quaker Church. I don't think the Quaker Church celebrates the Lord's Supper, but all other churches do. Some churches do it every Sunday, don't they? Some churches do it once a year. Some churches include it in a wedding ceremony or in a funeral ceremony. I've seen it in both of those kinds of settings as well. I have been in different kinds of settings. I've been in a church where it was a part of the offering every Sunday. I kind of thought that took away from it a little bit, uh, somewhat. I, Baptists generally do it one of a couple of ways. So a lot of Baptist churches do it once a month, like the last Sunday or the first Sunday of the month. Uh, some of them do it once a quarter. Some of them do it around uh, major themes of the year kind of thing. And uh, uh, the Bible tells us that as often as you do it, we do it in remembrance of Jesus. And so when we think about this, we're never told how often to take the Lord's Supper service. We're simply told that it's a time when we are remembering what Jesus did for us, that he died on the cross for us. So, uh, I personally developed kind of an idea over the years that the Lord's Supper service needs to be kind of standalone. The church that I grew up in did it um, once a month, and then they went to once a quarter, and they did it at the conclusion of the service. So when whatever Sunday it was happening on, then they had a regular service, and then it was tacked on to the end. Not to take away from the pastor what they were doing, but I thought over the years as becoming a pastor that it needed to be the central theme of the worship service. And so uh, we kind of developed that a little bit, so it's not just tacked on at the end of a service. First time I ever led in the Lord's Supper service as a pastor um, Anna and I have been called to a little country church in Oklahoma, out in the hills of Oklahoma. There was uh, no stoplights. There was a couple of intersections, and the intersection that uh, our church was close to had uh, the feed store and the, a grocery store and a, and a gas station and a post office all wrapped up in one. And then there was a house on one corner and a barn on another one. And the church was right down the street from there. And, and then there was just people out, in the, out underneath oak trees everywhere, just ranches and farms. And it was a fantastic time. And uh, they actually had seven deacons. That's how many of the Bible talked about, seven deacons. And so we had seven deacons. And those fellows just loved us. So we went there. At, we were in seminary. And the first Sunday for me to do the Lord's Supper service, the chairman of the deacon's name was Hollis. Hollis was an old cowboy and a barber. He was the local barber in Antlers, Oklahoma. I don't know if you've ever been to Antlers, but it's right off the Indian Nation Turnpike. And so he was a barber, and he wanted it to be special because this was my first Lord's Supper service. The deacons knew that. That was my first Lord's Supper service do as a pastor of a church. So they made the table very special and with linen and all kinds of things. It was all sorts of stuff that was there. And they turned the lights down a little bit and it was just very special. And so as we're going through it and I took the lid off and of course what normally happens is that the top of this often has the bread trace on it. And so the bread trays that particular day had uh, linen underneath it, linen napkins underneath it, and linen napkins on top of the bread. And one of the ladies had actually made the bread. And so it was time for to do this. I reached down and I took that napkin to take it off to break the bread. And as I pulled that napkin, I also got the bottom napkin and that bread went all over the floor. <clears throat> the deacons looked at me and looked at that. They just scooped it up and put it back in the plate. <laughs> and we went on with my very first Lord's Supper service. You see, they really don't teach you how to do stuff in seminary. In uh, Grand Canyon uh, College, 
we had to do a baptism or talk about a baptism ceremony and a funeral service and a Lord's Supper service, but we never really did it, you know, and so there was no hands-on and that kind of a thing. So the Lord's Supper is very special in my life. I remember the first time as a child to, that I took the Lord's Supper service because, you see, the Lord's Supper is for people who know the Lord Jesus as personal Savior. The Lord's Supper was given to the church to celebrate, to remember what Jesus has done. It's not given to the general public. It's given to the church, to people who know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So I grew up going to a little Baptist church in Clifton, Arizona. Probably went there before I was even born, taken to church. And I grew up in this church. <clears throat> I had relatives that went to church there and friends that went to church there, and it was great. And so every time they had the Lord's Supper service, uh, my father, uh, he would pass the tray on to the next family down beyond me. He said, no, you can't do that, bud. And uh, it would go beyond me. And I would say, well, why not? He said, you're not ready. And there wasn't a lot of explanation from him on this. And so I would look at that juice, and I'd look at that bread, and I would think, well, I sure would like some of that. And I didn't quite understand. He did not comprehend about the significance of the Lord's Supper. In the spring of 1958, I was in third grade. And uh, one evening, my father was at work, and my mom was reading the Bible to my two brothers and I. And I asked her, what does it mean to be a Christian? Why do you need to be a Christian? How do you become a Christian? Those questions. So she shared with me that a Christian is someone who asks Jesus to come into their heart so that when they die, they don't go to hell and they get to go to heaven. And so that night, lying in my own bed, I just prayed as simple as I could as an eight-year-old to ask Jesus into my life. A couple of weeks later, when I got home from school, I had to walk, you know, one of those proverbials, walk five miles uphill both ways in the snow, Cornadale. Well, it was uphill. And it was downhill because we lived in the mountains. And uh, the school was about three-quarters of a mile away. I walked home, and there in our living room, sitting on our couch, was our pastor, Pastor Jack. <clears throat> it was his name, Jack Foster. He went on to become a professor at Arizona Christian University. But uh, uh, so he was sitting there, and my mom and dad had talked to him, and, and had shared with him that I was asking questions. Could he come and ask her my questions? So we talked about what it meant to be a Christian. I shared with him that I have invited Jesus into my heart when I was praying. He went over John 3, 16, but very clearly that God loves you and that we're in danger of going to eternity without him. And Jesus is the solution to our problem, but you have to believe in him. You actually have to invite him into your life. So we prayed together, confirmed my inviting Jesus into my life. In the fall, I had turned nine years old, and I was baptized. And the baptistry in this little country, uh, little town, uh, Baptist church, Clifton, Arizona, was a huge wooden building, clapboard, white, bell. It had old ceiling fans, and it had theater wooden seats the kind, you know, that fold up and you can get pinched in and sort of stuff. They had those, and uh, the cast iron on the edges of it and everywhere. It was a wonderful place for little boys because there you could play hide-and-go-seek in that church. It was fantastic. And the baptistry was a trap door on the platform right there. And um, they would lift that trap door up, run a garden hose to it, and I don't know how they heated it. I probably had some sort of element they stuck in it. And uh, uh, so on a Sunday night, I was baptized along with Betty Wilcox Wilcoxon. And I'll never forget that night, the night that I was baptized, the age of nine. Well, about a month later, <clears throat> I was sitting on the front row of the church when uh, communion, the Lord's Supper, was about to be served. And I was sitting with my aunt, my dad's oldest sister, and as the Lord's Supper was being passed, as the tray was being passed, she handed it to me. And she says, it's okay, you can take it now. And I thought, really? And what changed? And she said, you've invited Jesus into your heart. And so I took the Lord's Supper. I remember that very clearly, the first 
time I received the Lord and the first time I shared in the Lord's Supper service uh, at the age of nine years old. It's called the Lord's Supper because the night that Jesus was arrested, he was celebrating Passover Supper, and he instituted that thing, that institution we call the Lord's Supper. Some churches want it to be a sacrament. A sacrament, sacrament means it has saving quality. We do not believe as Baptists that taking the Lord's Supper makes you a Christian. I take the Lord's Supper because I am a Christian. There is a difference. It doesn't have saving power, but I observe it because I have been saved. And it's called the Lord's Supper because he instituted, he started it the night of that supper that he was sharing with the disciples. It's, and then it's, it's called breaking of bread. And so when you think about the breaking of the bread on this and the breaking of that bread, Jesus would have picked up a piece of bread and it probably would have been flat, something like pita bread, and he broke it. And he said, take this and eat this. This is my body, which is broken for you. So oftentimes people refer to the Lord's Supper as breaking bread. In fact, in the book of Acts, that there is a reference to Christians were meeting in each other's homes, breaking bread together. So many people think that they were sharing in the Lord's Supper, even in homes, was those little home cell groups were meeting together. Some people call it communion. In fact, that's a very common phrase, communion. And that word communion has reference to the very idea that we are, there's a oneness, that there is a fellowship, there is a, a brotherhood, there is a oneness together. And so it's communion with Jesus, communion with the Holy Spirit, communion with the Father, communion with other believers. We're a oneness. It's a family. We're sitting down together. That's one of the things that made Thanksgiving difficult this year for lots of families because of not being able to be together. So Lord's Supper, communion is being together. It's communion with God's Spirit, His presence, and with each other. And some churches call it the Eucharist. Uh, the Catholic Church will call it the Eucharist. And so that's a Greek word that means thanksgiving, the ability to give thanks. So this is a very proper Sunday to be able to do this, this Sunday after Thanksgiving, because we're giving thanks, giving thanks for what Jesus did for us. There's a past and a present and a future dominion to when you think about the Lord's Supper. The night that Jesus was arrested and he instituted the Lord's Supper, they were celebrating Passover. They were celebrating something that had happened in history. God had given to them the instructions. Once a year, you had a very special meal and a week, an entire week, that you remembered what the Passover was. When God rescued the people his people from Egypt, from the dominion of slavery, and he set them free in the context of a historical event that happened, the Lord's Supper was set in place. And so, but it's not just the history of the Passover. Now, for you and I today, the significance of the past is that we are celebrating the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. It's a historical fact. Jesus existed. Even outside of Christian writers, it's acknowledged there was a person called Christ. People believed he is God. He died, was crucified. History writers of that time talked about this person that we call Christ. He died. So there is a past dominion. And when he uses the word remember, as often as you do this, remember what I did. I died on the cross for you. His body was broken. It's very possible that night that we use cups, but they would have, there would have been perhaps four goblets on the table. And they would have been filled with most likely wine. We as Baptists don't use wine. We use non-alcoholic wine called 
Welch's, grape juice, you know. So no danger there with that. But he would have picked up that cup, and he would have said, they would have seen him pick it up. They would have seen the bread, and he would have said, this is the cup of a New Testament. In the context of the past, I'm giving you something new. And this is the new covenant, my blood being shed for you. But there is also the aspect of the future. And the scriptures that, part of the scriptures that Mark read in 1 Corinthians 11, and we're going to read in a few moments Luke 22. As often as you do this in remembrance of me, Paul said, you are showing that Jesus is coming again. There is a future dimension to the Lord's Supper that we are celebrating that Jesus is one day going to come again. He told the disciples, he says, I won't be eating with you until the kingdom of God comes again. We know that that morning beside the Sea of Galilee with Peter and restoring Peter, there was fish. Perhaps he ate there. But he had said that there will be a future time when I will be in communion with you. I will fellowship with you. There will be a meal. Future. There is a future for us. Our future is secure in Jesus. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're celebrating that Jesus has a future for us. He is coming again. There is a place called heaven, and it's secure for all of his children. But there is a present dimension to the Lord's Supper service. And that's where that word communion does come into play. That God's Holy Spirit is here. In the context of sharing, when someone does something and you go to them and talk to them, there is a statement that is made that when two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. God's Spirit is here today. Some churches believe the bread and the wine actually become the blood and the body of Jesus. We don't believe that, but we believe it represents the body and the blood of Jesus. But we very much believe Jesus is right here. His Holy Spirit is here today. His presence is here today because he lives in your heart. All those who call upon the name of Jesus, his spirit is placed in your life today. So there's the past and the future and the present in communion with him today. But the Lord's Supper service, when I think about approaching the table, coming before the table, I, I think at times when as a boy growing up, when I came to my mother's table every evening, when the evening meal was prepared, the word she would say would be, go wash, supper is ready. Go wash, go wash up, supper's ready. Get ready, don't come to the table with dirty hands. And so when we come to the Lord's table today, we don't wanna come with dirty hands. So what cleans my hands? The blood of Jesus does. The only reason I am worthy to receive the Lord's Supper is because of what Jesus has done, what he's done for me. And so Paul encourages us in 1 Corinthians 11, the church at Corinth was doing things in a bad way. They were not pleasing God. And Paul said, I can't commend you for this. He says, it's a time for you to examine your hearts. Before you take the Lord's Supper, examine your heart. Let the Lord come and clean you. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin in our lives. From all sin. And so I come before him and I confess. I say, Lord, please forgive me. You know my attitudes this week. You know my prejudice. You know the words I've said. Lord, my heart, the apathy, whatever. And I come before him and I ask him to please cleanse my heart that I would be right with him. And so we're going to do that in just a moment before we proceed. We want to take a time when we can just, just you and the Lord personally, just spend time with him for a few moments. And so I'm going to just share a simple prayer, and then 
I'm going to give you a few moments, and you just spend time with the Lord together. Father, <clears throat> we're in your awesome presence today. We've gathered to worship you. We have sung praises to you. We've prayed together. And Lord, we've opened your word together. And now, Lord, as we gather around this simple table to celebrate, to remember what Jesus has done for us, your word encourages us to examine our hearts. David said, Lord, to examine him, to examine me, see if there be any wicked way in my heart. So we invite you today, Lord, put your finger on that spot that's come between you and I. Lord, bring conviction. Speak to us even today, Lord, even now as we pray. Father, in the quietness of this room, we want to do business with you. So, Lord, it may be that we have not done anything outrageous, but it may be that we've just done nothing. We've just been apathetic, floating through life. Our time with you is, is not meaningful. We're not reaching out to others. So perhaps, Lord, in this moment, it needs to be a time of renewal. But Lord, reignite that flame in our hearts. Give us that zeal. Lord, perhaps at times like this with this pandemic, fear is taking over our hearts. So we pray for your peace, anxiousness, and worry. Lord, so we pray you would replace that with your grace in our lives. Lord, attitudes that come to the surface and are evident with words that are spoken. So we pray, Father, for your touch, your conviction. We ask your forgiveness today, Lord. We know, Lord, we're not worthy in and of ourselves to even take of the Lord's Supper. It's only because of you and what you've done. So, Lord, in these moments, we just say, Lord, you are the potter and we're the clay. You mold us and make us to what you desire. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite the men to come forward that are going to help us today with a celebration of the Lord's Supper. If you'd like to turn to Luke chapter 22, 
that's where we're going to be reading from as we go through the Lord's Supper today. Luke chapter 22. And we're going to be doing it a little differently today than we normally do because of the pandemic. Things You're going to receive a self-contained cup today. So uh, we're going to ask you to please be careful with it because it's, uh, it's kind of flimsy cellophane. And the lid has two lids. I say the lid has two lids. The cup has two lids. And the first uh, layer... Uh, has the piece of bread in it. So when you receive it in just a moment, you'll see the piece of bread in there. And uh, uh, so when it comes time to take the bread in a few moments, then you'll peel back the first lip. And then after that, when it comes time to receive the juice, then you'll pull back the second lip. You'll see it as it's there. But I would encourage you, especially if you're wearing white, be careful. If you squeeze it too tight, it, uh, it might squirt. So just be careful with it today. Luke chapter 22 gives a recording for us of the Lord's Supper. Luke 22, verse 7, if you'd like to follow along. Then came the day of unleavened bread in which the Passover lamb has to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. Say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He'll show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this, divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with me on the table. The Son of Man will go as it's been determined, decreed. But woe to that man who betrays him. Let's pray together. Father, we come today to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And as we celebrate today, we pray for your direction through all of this, Lord. The cup that represents your blood, the bread that represents your broken body. Because you died, we can have salvation. Because you rose from the dead, we have the promise of eternity with you. Salvation is sealed. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen.
and ask God's blessings upon this bread. Father, today, the bread represents the broken body of Jesus. Father, today, as we take this into our bodies, it permeate every cell, your Holy Spirit, when we invite you into our hearts to become our Savior, permeates every cell of our very being. We thank you, Lord, for the broken body of Jesus. John 6, 58 says, This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. If you'd like to take the other lid off, Takes two hands, doesn't it? Let's ask the Lord's blessings on this cup. Father, Jesus raised the cup up and said, This is the blood, my body, a new testament, a new covenant for you. Lord, his blood was shed for us. And with the shedding of blood comes the forgiveness of sin. We thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus that covers our sins. In your name we pray. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, according to the law, we can almost say all things are cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And 1 John 1, 9, 1, 7 says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. There'll be a receptacle at the doors in a few moments where you can put that. And the Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians 11, as Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord what I have delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. On that night, they stood, they sang a hymn, they went out into the night. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus would pour out his heart to the Lord. Lord, if there be any other way, let it be done. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. We invite you to stand with us. Our praise team is going to come at this time, and we're going to share a song.
love you. May you be real people who live to lead others to find life in Christ this week. And we'll see you here next week.